Zoltan was the most powerful man in Czechoslovakia after Second World War. He was the head of military, internal, and external security of Czechoslovakia, together under Gottwald, together with young Masaryk, Muslanski. There's many stories that you can hear if people have to just to listen about his meeting with Stalin, with Khrushchev, whatever he accomplished. But Zoltan Toman made a decision. When refugees, Jewish refugees, from Romania, from Poland, from Hungary, wanted to reach Czechoslovakia, they had no visas. And Zoltan made a decision to let them in without visas. They entered Czechoslovakia. Zoltan later was put in jail for being a traitor to the Czechoslovakian country, put in jail, fled the jail. His wife, so he was told, made suicide, and his two-year-old two son disappeared. Zoltan is still looking for him. When Mrs. Havel was my guest six months ago, I asked her to send her a letter to President Havel to continue to search for the son of Zoltan. I got an answer recently that you don't find it. Now Zoltan came to Venezuela and started a new life penniless. He made money, but all his life was about commitment to the survival of Israel and for charity. His name is all over here. He's on a doctorate from here. He supported many activities. And then he made me a phone call seven months ago to talk to him and then to fly to Caracas. And he told me, I feel it's my duty for Israel. I feel it's my duty because I believe the future of Israel is in the Negev and Ben-Gurion is right. And I want to give five million dollars for academic excellence because I believe since we have conversation for a long time, what shall we commit this $5 million endowment? We both agree this for academic excellence. Now, Zoltan is not alone because we have the most beloved, devoted wife, Maria. And Maria is a partner in every sense of the world. And Maria and Zoltan, we cherish you, we love you, we symbolize for us what is the bind that put all the Jewish people together. And this bind and this dynasty will continue here. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Zoltan Tom, please. I was born as a Jew in a small village in Slovakia. My parents were strictly Orthodox people and when I was five years old, I had already to go to the, to the Haider. Six years old, we started to learn in the state school to write and to read. When I was 10 years old, by the way, I liked very much the Haider, and I felt very much to be a Jew. When I was 10 years old, I went to the bridge of our village, and there were the artisans of the village, and one of them came to me and said, you dirty Jew, he hit me, and I fell down. After we went to the physician, I asked my father, to go to the security man to denounce it. My father told me, 
We can do it because we are Jews. And we have been born to suffer. I couldn't take it. And because of this, I saw, I went away from my Jewishness and I saw the solution to anti-Semitism in the Golden Catholic Communism. But I want to tell you that I realized once a Jew, always a Jew. And I want to tell you also, for I know the plans I have for you, to give you a future and a hope, I will, and I will return to this saying of mine before, before I close my speech. Because of my position in the Czechoslovakian government, I had the opportunity to open the frontiers for the Jews from Romania, Polonia, Hungary, and other countries. I don't want, as, as I can't talk long, I want only to tell you that the director of the joint, Jacobson, asked an audience out for me and came to see me and started to tell me that the Jews are persecuted in those countries and if I could do something about it. I called in my secretary and dictated to him a short order, all Jews, without any documentation. When they say that they are Jews, have to be admitted to Czechoslovakia. And that is what happened. 100,000 of Jews came to Czechoslovakia, and from Czechoslovakia, they went to Palestine. These people and many others have contributed, contributed to the formation of the modern state of Israel. But unfortunately, I had to defy just two superpowers in their effort to halt this immigration. One of the superpowers was the Soviet Union whose ambassador was sorry, and who went to see the president of the republic. The, the prime minister, Gottwald, who was a communist. The other one was Steinhardt, the ambassador Steinhardt, a Jew. <clears throat> and of course, both of them insisted that the frontiers had to be closed. It took a time, but at, at the end, I had to do so. I wouldn't talk much about this thing, only I want to tell you that Jan Masaryk, who was the Minister for Foreign Affairs, after I closed the frontiers, a few weeks later, he phoned me and said to me at night, Tom Anku, I am going to New York to the United Nations meeting and I want to bring the good notice to a friend of mine. By the way, do you know Baruch? I told him, I know his name. He said, he is circumcised like you, and I want you to open the frontier again. I told him I couldn't do this, 
but that we should go to see Gotthard, who was at this time sick, and try to, to make him to permit it. He went to see Gotthard, and next night he phoned to me, telling me that Gotthard was in agreement. I knew that this was impossible. Impossible because Gottwald wouldn't tell him that yes, when Stalin gave the order that Jews shouldn't come to Czechoslovakia. But I said to Masaryk, all right, minister, in the morning I give the order to open the frontiers. And that is what happened. And I wrote a note to Gottwald telling him, dear Klemma, Masaryk phoned me at night, telling me that you agree that I should open the frontier, so I opened the frontier. And I sent this with a motorized. When Godward received this letter, this note of mine, he called the minister and told him, Send me Toman because I am going, going to kill him. And Nosek told me, be careful because if you go to Godfall, maybe he will indeed kill you. So my answer was, Vashek, there are always two persons when somebody has to be killed. One who is killed and the other one, the killer. You can be sure that I shall be the, the killed one. Anyway, then Godward said to me that he had his pipe in his mouth, he didn't say anything, and that Masaryk misunderstood him. And they asked me again to close the frontiers. Then one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and the minister said to me, then on well will you cross the frontiers? Not yet. And at the end I told him, look, if you want to cross the frontier, you have to do it. I am not going to do it. Anyway, this was the principal thing. Why I was jailed. And after my escape, I was condemned to be hanged. I came to Venezuela. I started there a business. And after I had some money, I wanted to use this money for education. So I phoned to the embassy, Israeli embassy and ask them which education institute needs more the money than the others. They told me that the University of Negev. So my first con contribution went to Negev. And I must confess to you, as a businessman I had, some good investments, but the best investment of my life was to give the University of Vancouver. <laughs> Through this life experience, I have become increasingly convinced that leadership in almost every calling is highly dependent upon an outstanding education and level of expertise. I am also convinced that the state of Israel's role in the Middle East as well in the international community is related to the education and expertise of the best of Jewish intellect. 
I am also convinced that higher educational system through as we work are perceived. The survival of our universities dependent upon the recruitment and retention of the best and brightest young people into academia. This is particularly important for Israel's youngest university, the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. This personal conviction and my love and admiration for Ben Gurion University over the past three decades has resulted in the establishment of an endowment in support, support of the development and maintenance of academic excellence with the first priority being the recruitment and retention of the best of Jewish intellect. I return to my serious title, for I have plans for you to give you a future and a hope. I am continuing to do my best for the University of Inversia. I would like to close with a challenge to us as in this audience and elsewhere. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Thank you very much. Term economists first was used, as far as I know, in the French 
I was referred to a group uh, headed by the physician, as a matter of fact, of to the Louis XV, a Kenet, uh, who first used that term and who later influenced the man who may be thought as the refounder of the subject, Adam Smith. And even in its earliest phases, there was an attempt not just to give practical advice, but to give a systematic understanding of the economy as a basis for that advice. And that uh, the process of the development of economics moved very quickly in that direction. Now, if there's one thing that distinguished economic advice through most of its period, it's that uh, it's distinguished by what I might call a cool attitude toward life. Um, emphasis on limits. Uh, it's not a question to the economist of good against bad, but it's a comparison of gains and losses, which is exactly the habit one might think of if you start studying businesses. Indeed, this emphasis on that there are always good and bad consequences of your action led the